you know the VFX guys, t you know, took the Shimmer to a whole another level. When 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 I was working on it, um, the things that inspired it were th even things like Northern Lights. You know, the way the way light ref uh, refracts through uh, atmospheres in interesting and different ways. And there were a couple of images where, yeah, I remember hitting on the idea of where the light would cut through trees or something like that, and and cut through the atmosphere, but you'd see the rainbow of colours, um, which which seemed to work, you know, and, and Alex liked that, uh, liked that a lot. You know, the, yeah, the way that light dances through atmosphere. And again, you know, the, the VFX guys took that to a whole nother level. We had two particular challenges where the weight of responsibility f fell hardest on the shoulders of the uh, VFX team. Um, one was, was the look of the shimmer itself, and the other was the look of the thing that was causing the shimmer. So the shimmer is effectively a radiating effect from one particular thing. And both of those things needed to be defined, and both of them were things that existed almost entirely in the world of visual effects. We talked a lot about different ways of representing it, whether it should be something that was gaseous, whether it should be something that was affected by somebody who walked through it. So if you prodded it, would it be like the surface of water and ripple, or should it be something that almost exists on a different plane and therefore it has no interaction with the objects around it? And that was, we sort of slightly hedged our bets between those two ideas. The shimmer is a prism, but it refracts everything. Basically, we looked at refraction. So we looked at the way light will pass through water particles in, say, the vapour trail of a plane, and you can get some weird rainbow effects happening within the vapour trail and use that to create the rainbow effects within the shimmer. And it would be that kind of thing, sort of prismatic effects. The subliminal effect of the interior shimmer was something that we worked hard at and had to try several iterations until we got the level right because it's interesting how strong you can make something visually and people, unless they're actually guided to notice it, won't notice it. And we needed to set up that there is this effect, which we did with a sort of huge wall of shimmer on the outside of it. So you've kind of hit the audience over their head with the idea that there is this thing and they're therefore a bit clued in to be looking for strangeness again once the characters are within it. And then after that we could sort of back away from it a little bit, so it's there throughout the film and it's there if you notice it, but I think for most people it's going to be something that's continually sort of prodding them subconsciously throughout it. I mean even there's, there's a scene in the guard tower where there's cracks in the panes in the glass and we added sort of refractive shimmer effect into some of those cracks in the panes in the glass. Now. I'm willing to bet 95% of the audience will never notice it consciously, but it's just always there as a, as a little cue just to you know, gently remind the subconscious mind. And then the physical structure of the shimmer on the outside, once we'd started designing the, the alien itself, and we, we used a 3D fractal form called a mandel bulb as our basis for this alien creature, and that creates these interesting, almost gothic, structures just by the nature of the way that the equations work those are the shapes that it produces we were able to use those and warp those and unwrap those to create this sort of wall around the most outer extent of the shimmer when you first see the shimmer that's what you're looking at is this mathematical structure that is then echoed at other points throughout the film but is finally resolved in the in the alien that's encountered at the chamber at the end it's inside me now what's inside you right from the beginning our conversations were hugely centered around the form of the alien and the nature of the alien and the way the form is informed by the nature of the alien we wanted something that sort of made sense when you saw it but at the same time didn't make sense and there's some shapes in mathematics that are very interesting like that. So we looked and looked, and eventually we found an app. And the app constructed a three-dimensional version of a 2D mathematical conceit, which is a shape, the Mandelbrot set, which is a fractal shape. And the 3D version of it is a Mandelbulb. And when you move that around, 
it moves in a way that is that feels organic but is also mathematical and is hard uh, or, or impossible really to predict in terms of its movements and yet sort of makes sense whilst not making sense so that was everything we wanted and our object our creature is not perfectly a mandelbulb we took a mandelbulb and then we did some things to it because again it, it had a narrative function that it needed to serve so it needed to have some aperture in the front of it which mandel bulbs naturally don't we try to make it slightly ambiguous as to whether it was smoky or solid and we added light sources within it so art department were able to build a sort of fiberglass glowing mandel bulb that sat on a stick in the middle of the room so again for framing up shots we had something there so we constructed the the uh the thing from a mandel bulb outwards, basically. The hardest parts were how we got from the, the mandel bulb into the humanoid. We knew we wanted to play a little bit with what the audience thought that they were looking at scale wise, where we would travel into the mandel bulb and then we would find the humanoid in some form within the mandel bulb and then the mandel bulb would open out into the room. So what you thought was a humanoid creature that's you know sort of about the size of an action man actually is human size and you're then not sure about the, the scale of anything that you're looking at. The final sequence is I think is going to be really um, beautiful looking. I mean Alex has such an amazing um, eye, like artistic eye, and, and I think it's going to be really unique to have the whole movie sort of be outside in nature and all of a sudden it really becomes very black and white almost in the um, interior of the lighthouse. And the forms are so, they look like biological forms, like plant or animal or something, and but also very alien, so I think it'll be quite beautiful. And um, actually the chamber itself, I worked with art department to make that so that that in, is also a mandel bulb. So I would sit down with Marco and Mish and Dennis and go, well, you know, how complicated do you want it? And they, you know, I'd sort of render something and go too complicated and I'd go make it a bit simple. It's like, yeah, kind of like that. And then I would be able to give them that geometry and then they were able to get the thing CNC machine. So the, actually the whole environment that that scene takes place in is a mandel bulb. So you've got a mandel bulb within a mandel bulb. The chamber set and the lighthouse set People who've poked their heads in so far are quite amazed by that. It's the culmination of the journey, I think, in terms of um, of the drama, of the um, change. It's all, it's it's the it's where it's where it's all started from, and we're backtracking to that. I think there's there's great scale and detail of out of control growth, and um, you know, mutant change. Stay character. Yeah. Yeah. Try to remember roughly what Jennifer did. You could watch it. Yeah. I am Sonoya Mizuno and I am playing the humanoid. I also have a small part as Katie, one of uh, Lena's students at the beginning of the film. So I met Alex on Ex Machina and he had this idea for what would usually be a typical action scene to make it something a bit more interesting and different and pushing the boundaries and because I have a background in dance we spoke a lot about it and how we could make a scene which was like a dance but not actually a dance and that's how this whole kind of idea evolved. Bobby, who was the choreographer for the end sequence, and Sonoya, who plays the humanoid, we did a whole fight choreography that was coming from so almost a dance to have sort of a different flavor than, than a usual fight. When the humanoid is going to be fully formed, it will be a kind of featureless, quite androgynous shaped person. So um, this is all going to become that in VFX, who eventually sets on fire. So then that's why I get changed into a very cool and expensive LED suit later. It's been really great to get to work with Sonora. She's obviously a professional ballet dancer, so she has this real ability to a, a really great gift for movement and so I really give her any credit for the symmetry of it because I feel like I'm sort of doing what I would do and then she's kind of mirroring it.
The basic idea was to have an alien that was truly alien, that was not like us in any way. It needed to have a kind of otherness. And that does then present you with a problem. If the alien is affecting everything else, and everything else needs to have an otherness, and the closer you get to the alien, the more other things get, and then when you meet it, it needs to deliver on the promise of being very other. It's a problem, it's difficult. If the alien wants to eat you, it's easier. I mean, look, I'm not being disparaging about a, one of my favorite movies of all time, actually, is Alien, which is about an alien that wants to eat people. But, um, uh, but at least you have something to go on, which is it's a killing machine. It's dangerous, it's fast. Yeah, it needs to have claws or teeth or something. If it wants to teach you about its galactic federation and improve your culture, you know, then it's, it's intelligent and smart and it's motivated. It's motivated by the same kind of things that motivate us. This thing is not motivated by any of the things that motivate us. It may not actually be motivated by anything. It might be like a spore or a, a mushroom or a cancer or you know, and have no real sentient qualities at all, just echoing qualities, who knows, you know?